So you have your yeah. leverage to the hilt. Everything. Credit cards maxed out. You've gone for broke, so to speak. Yep. And then they're telling you can't open. Yep. We're all about turning a crappy situation into something about positive. A quarter million dollars of credit card I debt. I still remember the day when no one turned out. Throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. I could give myself a chance. So I started something. I mean, I think that counts as from poop to gold. <laughs> Welcome back to From Poop to Gold. I'm your co-host, Benton Crane. And today I am joined by Nick Francis, founder and CEO of Sky Sprout Marketing Agency and Sky Sprout Summit. Welcome to the podcast, Nick. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Nick, let's get started. I want to dive right into your background. So you got started at the young age of six years old in the industry of haunted houses. Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> Tell us about it. So I had always kind of thrown a little Halloween party with my parents for the kids at school. And every year we had a haunted house that we set up and it was really fun. It was always something that I looked forward to. And that passion for like putting something cool together for people to experience kept growing and growing. And then around 15 or 16, um, my cousin Max Simon came to town to finally see it. And he said, okay, we should do this and make it a business. And you had done it every year in that time? Yeah, just okay. decorate different parts of the house for friends. And, and it was uh, it ended up being pretty big by the time he had come where he'd filled up like the backyard and the garage and it was a, it was a whole thing. And Is this the type of thing that all the neighbors would come? And So we didn't really have, like nobody really trick-or-treated in our neighborhood. So it was all just that one night for that one party. Um, and, and yeah, it just became something where nobody else really decorated at all in our neighborhood. So that was, I think that was another reason why we wanted to do it because we, we didn't get to like have fun walking around and seeing all the cool decorations and trick-or-treating. So it kind of turned your house into the neighborhood hub yeah. on Halloween. Right. Um, and then we took that and grew it. The first year we did it commercially, it was about 3,000 people came out for the month of October, Fridays, Saturdays-ish. Um, to your house? No. So we did it in the back. Uh, sorry, I skipped a step. In the backyard, we did uh, one year where Max and I said, let's just try and build the biggest haunted house we can, but still keep it you know, on the parents' property. And we built like a 3,000 square foot structure in the backyard out of like wooden wall panels <laughs> and we entered a contest with good morning america to try and win the best decorated like haunted house uh, like in america like the best decorated house for halloween and we ended up getting the most votes nationwide when it came to them to pick out of the top five we didn't win um but we had so many people reaching out saying we want to go and see this that we had over 500 people show up um on halloween to go through it and after that, we were like, there's definitely going to be a business here. So from that, we did it commercially, did 3,000 people our first year, doubled in attendance every year until we were at 32 to 35,000 our last year, and then had several thousand more throughout 35, the- 35,000 people? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So it was 35,000 customers that came through in the month of end of September and October. And then we even integrated like a scary Valentine's Day event and zombie laser tag in the summer and all these extra things. And so I think we were roughly right under 40,000 for the whole year in terms of customers. And we lost that piece of real estate that we were in and have been looking ever since in 2015. And in that time, um, I knew that what helped most of our growth was throwing a fantastic uh, event, but it was also the fact that we really got good at digital marketing because we couldn't afford to hire anybody to do it. So we knew that we kind of like had this niche product and this niche thing and that it was kind of on hold, but I said, well, we're really, really good at digital marketing. So let's see where that takes us. And I started, you know, doing work on the side for different companies. And, uh, it was always kind of on the back burner working out of the second bedroom in my apartment. And two years ago, year, sorry, year and a half ago, opened this office and yeah, then Sky Sprout marketing. Yeah. Agency, so right? this is the, this is the current, uh, agency. And we have four people on staff now, and we just started the conference, which was at the beginning of the year. So we did the agency model, very basic for a year. And I said, well, this is super cool. Like we're hiring people, we're impacting businesses, but we're missing that fun, exciting thing to look forward to every year that the haunted house gave. And I felt like what would be cool would be to do a conference. And so as we, you know, we don't know how to throw a conference, knew nothing about it. And the beginning of the year of this year, about six months ago, I said, we're just going to do it. Let's just go for it. Let's make it maybe a little smaller our first year and, you know, just hire local speakers. And then it just grew out of control for the first year to a massive production budget, massive speakers, um, getting some of the, the biggest in the industry, including yourself. And it was, it was 
unbelievable. How did you originally fund the haunted house? Sure. And in the off season, who stored all this stuff for you? Did you just put it in your parents' garage? You guys have a storage shed? What'd you guys do? So those are really good questions we should have asked before we did everything, um, but we didn't. So we just took it one year at a time. And like the first year, it was finding a friend that owned a storage unit and like begging him to let us keep it in there. And they said yes for a couple of months. And the next year, it was trying to work out a better deal with the landlord that we were renting from to, hey, can we tear everything down, but like keep it stored in the back warehouse? And, and if you lease it, we'll, we'll take it out. And it was super bootstrapped. Like every year was a different challenge of how we were going to get it set up, how we were going to fund it, how we were like everything. There was never a concrete plan going into the year on how it was going to happen. Uh, we try every year to get better and better. And I think by the last two or three years, we, we, we were much more established and really had it, had it worked out because we were in a, a building year round. So it, it solved a lot of the problems, but man, those first couple of years, I look back and I'm like, we barely made that work. Like we, we, we just did it. Like it's just one of those things where you're like, yep, we're going to just go for it and if, and do whatever it takes to make it happen. So, and then the funding was honestly family. Um, and the, but a lot of it at the beginning was, you know, we just didn't need anything up until the first year. And then it was a couple thousand bucks. And then the next year was a lot of money. And then after that, it was just reinvesting everything. So it was, so you scrapped together a couple thousand bucks, had that first success where you mm -hmm. had 3000 people come through. Um, I assume you charged those 3000 people. Mm -hmm. So then you had some income that you could reinvest into the next year. Is that kind of how it happened? That first year was an exception because that was uh, for charity. So we donated all the net proceeds to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And what that was was great, awesome, because we didn't even, we still didn't know if this was actually going to be a business. We just felt like there's something there. Um, so we got to donate to charity and then we got a lot of stuff for free because we just wanted to see it happen. We weren't worried about the money. It was just like, what can we do to just make this a reality? Um, after that, we learned like it wasn't enough like in return, I guess. I don't know how to say that properly, but like we, we couldn't figure out the finances to give all the money away and put on the event right. that we wanted. Um, and so we still privately donate every year to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, but we on our own, but to it became a, a business after that, which is why that second year was really capital intensive. Yeah, but the, the event has to, has to fund itself. Right. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, why did the haunted houses end? Um, so they, that the fear experience, that haunted house ended in 2015. I say ended. Um, it's never supposed to like, it's never, we're never saying we're never going to open again. We actually would, would love to open tomorrow if we could. Um, we just cannot find a piece of real estate that is in Cleveland, you know, that we, that we like, that's where the haunted house was. Um, and so one of my biggest clients right now, our biggest client is 13th floor entertainment group, and they own 15 plus haunted houses across the country, tons of escape rooms. And I, you know, we've been friends with the founders for, you know, the past five to 10 years. And we, we get to live in that world now as an agency and, and help them with their Facebook ads and, and all of that good fun stuff. Um, but we don't own one, but it is kind of a nice balance to be able to still, you know, be in that world that we really, really love, um, but not owning one. And a hundred percent will reopen our haunted house one day. Just, just need to find real estate. When we got our last building, we were paying next to nothing. And we got it in like 2009, right after the economy tanked. So it was like the perfect time. And then when we needed a new one, the economy was great. And so nothing was like the market's getting a little softer now. So it might be a good time gotcha. in the future. Gotcha. Be patient. See if the market has a correction, then, then jump on something. Yeah. Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit, Nick. Every entrepreneur has one of those moments where everything has gone wrong. You are, um, you're in kind of the depths of despair. The hour is dark. You don't know if you're going to come out the other side and still have a business. Yeah. What has that moment been for you? I've had a couple. I'll give a good one. That's about our haunted house. Um, this is kind of some like dirty laundry, but not, but it's really, it's really powerful. I think. So we, on our last year, we had a really, really big challenge with just getting open. Like we had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars of our own money of every, every dollar we had had at that point, And then maxed out the two company, like everything was, was on the line. Um, and then we started to get some conflict with the local fire marshal 
building inspectors of like just trying to find common ground on on you know we'd grown this business there was no other like big haunted house companies in our city so everybody was trying to figure this out together like what should the regulations be like what should the what should it be for a haunted house meaning from the fire marshal's perspective Correct. there was no precedent for this it, it's a gray area and up to their interpretation and at the end of the day it's up to them to determine like what's a safe event regardless of what's what's written down like their job is to make the safest event possible and while that's our job as well um it's a lot easier for a business, like a, a brick and mortar business. Like there's just structured code for building a building. It's yep. black and white. And for a haunted house, unfortunately not as black and white. It's very, it's very, very different. And so um, we were we were going through that and had everything on the line in the moment where I'm like, holy cow, like this is real. Like we could just lose all of this was the day before we opened the like somebody from the city and a deputy sheriff walked in with a padlock and a, and a chain and said yep you're not getting your permit oh my goodness so you have your yeah. leverage to the hilt everything credit cards maxed out you've gone for broke so to speak yep and then they're telling you can't open yep so what did that feel like um super surreal but like it, it humbles you a lot to be like cool you can lose all of this like you can lose everything in business like overnight and to have that experience, when, especially when I was like, I'm still young as heck, but like when I was even younger, like really set me up to be much more on the defense than I had been up to that point uh, with business. And I'm still very like more offense than defense, but that made me be like, okay, like make sure you're not in a position because anything can happen. Like your business partner could pass away. Like your anything, anything in the world, you could be sick and in the hospital. Like, and then how do you service your clients? Well, it's great making all the money working from home, but you can't do that if something bad were to happen to you. And then what happens to your family? So you've got to build a business that has employees that can solely do that. So that humbled me a heck of a lot and made me understand that like anything can happen. So yeah, it was a very, I would say that was like very, very bad to the best when we saw the biggest attendance we ever had. We filled like a 700 car parking lot. Like it was surreal that whole season. We got through that. I'm like, wow. Like, I don't even know how to deal, handle all these customers. Like it was amazing. So Nick, Haunted Houses started out as basically a hobby for you. Is that correct? Yes. But that kind of transitioned into the launch of your career. Do you have any advice that you would give to people who are developing a hobby or have a hobby they love and how they can kind of take that next step into turning it into something that could either be their, their career or it could potentially launch their career? Yeah, I think when I did The Haunted House, I didn't think about it as like that progression of like a uh, hobby to career. It just was a whirlwind. Um, and then looking back, I realized I was following a passion and not the money. And then at the beginning of this year, it was kind of fun. I went to a massive, massive conference and one of the speakers was um, Steve Harvey. And in the middle of this, I'm sitting there I'm like, something's like I've been a year before that feeling like something was like missing and he said um your gift will make room for you and i didn't necessarily know what that meant and then he started to explain like if you're following what you're truly truly the best at and what you're truly truly good at and what like you know you were gifted with um it'll make room for you in the world and it'll it'll work out and you will be able to find a way to make a living out of that and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a thing you love the most or whatever but it's a thing that you can't you know, live and function without and that you know you're the best at. And so when you're doing something that you're truly, truly passionate about, that is a much, much easier uh, thing to turn into a business than to say, I need to make a certain amount of money. I need to do this. And if you're constantly worrying about the money, which is, I mean, listen, it's business. It's the whole thing. We can't get too, too foo-foo-y with it, but like really it's, it makes all the difference in the world. I talked about it with uh, the content production at the conference, how much easier it is to post when you're just passionate about what you're doing. Um, but I think the, I think it's baby steps, you know, take something that you enjoy and baby step into, you know, can you make this into a, a career? Um, and then also, you know, I think a lot of times what I see young entrepreneurs especially is, man, if I could just win the lottery, I just quit my job. And I'm like, how much you make? 40,000 a year. I'm like, so you don't need to make a hundred million dollars. You need to make 40,000 a year. They're like, yeah. I'm like, don't you think you could do that starting your own business with like a year of work? Probably. It's like, well then do it. Like the options are not make a million dollars, start an app, be Mark Zuckerberg or, or Warren Buffett or 
keep working in your miserable job. It's like work in your job that you dislike or figure it out and make that same amount of money or, or even a little less, you know, like it's so much easier to be happy, make a little less money than it is to work somewhere you hate or to just have the whole focus be, I just need to make a million dollars. Like that's the most right. pointless goal in the entire world. Every time in my life that I've followed the money, I failed every single time that I followed my passion and done what I'm good at has been a success. So I love it. One of the things that uh, when people ask me, you know, whether or not they should be making the jump, so to speak, I feel like there are two conditions that kind of need to be in place for somebody to be able to make the jump. And it's that they're able to cover their needs financially, mm -hmm. because if they can cover their needs financially, then they have the flexibility and the patience to be able to pursue passions and and to take risks and to try things. Um, and because their, their basic needs are being met, they can have that patience to be able to do it versus someone who's like, okay, I have to, I have to have this all figured out in the next 60 days or else I'm going to lose my house or I'm not going to be able to put food on the table or whatever it is. Those people just don't have the perspective to be able to, um, it, to make a long-term play like like building a business yeah um in my opinion and then the second piece correct. of it is how big are your needs right so oftentimes we tie ourselves to you know enormous amounts of debt or um large expenses multiple cars big house um you know toys a boat an rv whatever it is yeah we get tied to all of these expenses and then we're like i'm stuck I'm in my career, so I have to pay all these bills. And so for someone who wants to get into entrepreneurship, I always say, make sure your basic needs are met and then minimize those needs. Like cost cut, pay yep. off some debts, do what you have to do so that covering your needs isn't such a huge task. Yeah, I think it's 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 that's the most important part. That's super well said. I think for, for me, not worrying about where are we going to go on a vacation? What's all these things? Like, I've always wanted these things. Like, sure, we always want these nice things or these nice trips, and they're awesome to take and they're awesome to do. But, like, I did a lot of amazing, cool stuff after our haunted house closed for that, like, year or two. And none of it made me as happy as the last, you know, 48 hours of running the conference did or running the haunted house when it was open still. Just that, that energy of that. And I think for most people, if, if you're, it's, I would be careful taking something as a hobby to entrepreneurship because make sure that the hobby is still a passion and it's not just a hobby. We can have tons of healthy hobbies that are great, um, but make sure if you're going to make it into entrepreneurship um, and if you want it to be as successful as it can be, make sure that it is actually like your core passion or your gift and not just a hobby because that's how you see it in life. They're like, yeah, it's the thing I do on the side and make some money. That could be a great thing that you do on the side and that makes some money doesn't have to be the thing that you put your heart and soul um, and everything on, on the line for. That might be something else that you need to just take some time and figure out and learn. Awesome. Nick, where can our listeners keep up with you? Where can they follow you? Uh, Nick J. Francis on Instagram and Nick Francis on Facebook. And you can email me at nick at skysprout.com. Awesome. Do you have anything coming down the pipeline that you'd like to... Uh, sneak a hint to our listeners yeah we're like 100 percent gonna do sky sprout summit next year um that's that's the big thing right now and so keep an eye out for that um and then we've got because of the success of this we've got a lot of really cool opportunities that are coming from it so i'd say just keep an eye on on my social we've got some really really cool stuff in the works awesome nick i want to be respectful of your time so um Thank you for coming on our podcast and thank you for inviting me to, to speak at your event. That was an honor um, and that was a fun experience for me. Uh, thank you for sharing, our, sharing your story with, with our listeners. I have a little gift for you here. Oh, geez. I have a copy of our book as thank well you. as a gift bag from many of our clients. Oh, cool. Um, and of course, for our listeners, if, if you're interested in kind of exploring how you can develop a creative culture inside of your company, um, our book from poop to gold, um, has some great information and great, um, uh, story behind how we created our creative culture. I've already so. read it. It's the first book when you walk in our office, that's on the, <laughs> on the thing. Thank you so much. Well, that, now you have a second copy yeah. for somebody here at the office.
That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks again, Nick. Thanks for listening to From Poop to Gold. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you on the next one.